there's four kind of different pictures, so various different genres. Don't worry if it doesn't necessarily gel with the kind of uh, photography that you do. All of the techniques that we're gonna look at today, you can apply to pretty much everything. So don't be too concerned about that. This is being recorded as it's going straight out to YouTube. Uh, so you'll be able to watch this, you know, almost immediately as it's finished. And um, uh, you can also pick it up tomorrow as well or rewind it and watch it as many times as you like all right so let's get started straight away any questions please do put them in the chat if you're in the webinar um, webinar room you'll find a Q&A panel as well so if you can try and separate out the questions into the Q&A panel uh, then that way it just separates it out from the chat those of you on YouTube and Facebook just feel free to pop your questions in the chat and we will get to those as well Okay, let's get going. So, a uh, bunch of different pictures, as I said. Let's start with this one, a very nice environmental portrait from our friend of the house, Emily Teague. And like a lot of the pictures that we're gonna look at today, they look pretty good out of camera. So that doesn't mean that we should just stop and not do anything. There's always a little way that we can finesse and improve something. So the main goal of this shot is a couple of things. Uh, first of all, on the right hand side, this area is kind of a bit bright and a bit dominant. So it means we're not really focusing on our, our handsome men in the middle, those three dudes. So that brighter area tends to draw us, uh, us away. So it's really a bit more about focusing on the subject at hand in the middle. So the first thing I'm gonna do, and the first thing that I generally do in an editing, editing process is to think about composition. So that's cropping, all those kinds of, of things. So I'm gonna grab my crop cursor tool from up the top here, and we're gonna crop in just not much, just a little bit tighter like so, and just cut out a little bit of the right hand side to some extent and kind of center these guys up in the middle. There we go. So happy with that. Exposure wise, it's pretty great out of camera. It, I might want to lift it a little bit. And now here's a, a good moment to learn about the difference between exposure and brightness. So I've already said this area is a bit on the bright side. So if I lifted up my exposure, that would also make this area brighter too and notice you know, that's almost kind of burning out on the right hand side. So exposure is going to brighten everything by uh, the same amount. So if I just want to lift up the mid-tones a bit, and these gentlemen are kind of pretty much sitting in a mid-tone, then a better approach would be just to lift up the brightness a touch. And that way our brighter areas are left untouched. So brightness is a great way of improving the brightness in the photo, but not making any changes to the highlights. So that's a good start. In terms of contrast and everything else, uh, let's just put a little bit of clarity in. So that's going to improve our contrast, but in the midtones only. It's not going to make many changes to the shadows or to the highlights. And in terms of high dynamic range, I'm going to pull the highlights down a touch, but we really don't need to do much else here. It's a nice soft flat light, so it's just ended up being a great shot out of camera. However, looking at the shot, we still tend to get a bit distracted by this brighter area on the right hand side. So two things we can do. The first thing is to just use a gradient mask to darken off that area a little bit. And then we can do a vignette or a radial mask to focus more on the center. So let's worry about the gradient mask first of all. So over in our layers panel, we're gonna grab our gradient cursor tool and we're gonna draw from the right hand side and stop about here. Now I know they're a bit hard to see, but essentially we've got three lines here. If I press M on my keyboard, M for mask, we can see the mask that we've created. Now the point of having three lines is that the right hand side line is where the mask is at its strongest, 100%. In the middle it's at 50%. And then by the time we've got here to the last line, it's faded down to zero. So that's like a symmetrical fall off from the one just above my head all the way across to the furthest one. Now we can make that asymmetrical, which is one I do, which is what I want to do. So I don't want too much masking on him. I don't want to make him any darker. So if we press, hold down our Alt key. Oh, is that out of focus? That's a bit better. If we hold down our Alt key on the keyboard, 
and then drag this one across, we can make the fall off asymmetric. And now I can just bring this out because I don't want to darken his face down anymore. So now once again, we've got a choice to make with our exposure sliders here. If we pull the exposure down, <coughs> excuse me, that's going to darken everything again. So it might make these shadows a bit too dark and dingy. See what I mean? So what I do is actually pull the brightness down a bit. It's not as harsh. And we can pull our highlights down a bit as well. And that just takes the brightness out of that area like so. So now if we turn this, whoops, wrong button. If we turn this uh, layer on and off, we can see before and after. So it's just taking the edge off it a little bit. And let's call that right hand side like so. Now the final or almost final thing that I want to do, because I'm sure we'll find something else to do, is uh, just to have a look at some kind of vignette to make them stand out from the background a bit. Before we do that, I noticed something I forgot to do, which was our levels. So as I said, I was pretty happy with the exposure. But you should always take a good look at your levels as, as the one of the early stages in your processing. Now, I'm very keen to say there's no point in having a strict step-by-step -step workflow to adhere to because that doesn't necessarily work for every photo. But something that I tend to do early on, as you've seen, is cropping and composition. I think just helps to edit the photo a bit better. And then once you've got your exposure roughly in the ballpark figure, we should be taking a look at the levels tool. Now you can see here, we've got a pretty nice even spread of tones until we get to the highlights where we don't have any information here. And what that can do is lead to a, the photo looking a little bit on uh, the flat side. So a generally very easy thing to do is just hit auto on the levels. That's this magic wand here like so. And that will just bring in the shadow and highlight points and give us a nice even spread on the histogram. So essentially it's like we're just tugging the ends of the histogram out so that they reach the full potential of their tonal range, essentially. Now, if it's a little bit harsh, you can of course bring these back. And one of the later edits that we're gonna do, the auto function is just a bit too much. So just by pulling it back out, you can lessen the extent. But if we do a option click on the reset, uh, sorry, wrong button, option click, you can see before and after. So that's just giving us a little bit of extra contrast, which looks uh, great. So back to the vignette. So a couple of choices for vignetting. We can use the vignetting tool down here, which works really super well, but there's no control over the shape or the way in which the tool darkens or brightens the areas. So you're very much letting Capture One do the driving there, but it is a great tool and it works well for the most part. So if we wanted to do a simple vignette, we could do so and it works really well. It doesn't block up the shadows, gives a nice overall effect. But as, a, as I said, you don't have any control on the shape and it's only one adjustment. It's a dark and brighten adjustment. So if we wanted to do something a little more specific for this photo, we're gonna start with making a, another layer and we're gonna call this just a radial mask. Uh, that's the correct term for it. And this is our radial uh, mask tool here. Now, the reason why I haven't done it on this layer, that was our gradient mask, if you remember, like so. If I was to draw the radial mask on that layer, it would just cancel out the gradient mask. So we don't wanna do that. So that's why we have a nice brand new layer. <coughs> Where I start drawing, so in the center, uh, the mask will kind of burst out from there. So it'll grow from the center, if you like. So think about where you want the center of the radial mask to be and then start drawing. So I'm gonna draw a shape that's something like this. Again, it has three lines. So 100, 50, zero in terms of the mask capacity. So to feather it off a bit more, we can just expand it like so. To squish the shape around, you can grab any of these handles in the corner and we can also rotate it just by hovering in the middle. So you can build a radial mask, which is, you know, a bit more fine tuned to your picture. And you can always retrospectively go back and change it. Now, the other benefit of doing a proper radial is that we have any adjustment tool that we can apply to that. Now, once again, I'd probably advise against using exposure because if we do do that, it will make the shadows dark quite quickly. 
So a better method would be to pull the brightness down a bit. Don't forget you could also play around with saturation as well. That looks pretty naff, so we're not gonna do that. But just keep in mind, you've got the ability to use any of the sliders. So I'm gonna pull the brightness down a bit more. Um, if we pull the blacks down, we can get some like deeper blacks in the shadows and just make sure it's not crushing that too much. So that just gives us a bit of extra focus on the, sub on the subject in hand. The last thing that we wanna do is I'm just gonna brighten these guys up a tiny bit, just on the front there, so they're lifting off the, uh, the photo a bit. Now the easiest way to do that would be to use a style brush. Style brushes were introduced uh, in Capture One 21. And they're a great accelerated way to do some quick local adjustments on your photos. And I'm gonna use them uh, a few times today as well. Now, if you're running on the uh, default interface of Capture One, then uh, you're gonna see your style brushes around here somewhere. What I've done is make myself a extra custom tool tab and just put in there the style brushes tool and the layers tool, just because I was running out of space to some extent in the exposure tool tab. So this way it gives me a nice empty tool tab where we can just see the full extent of what can be done in a style brush. And it's also easier for you to see what's going on as well. If you don't know how to make your own style brush, if you right click anywhere up in this dead space, you can add a new tool tab and say, add a custom tool tab. And then once you've added your custom tool tab, you can use the same command, right click, and just uh, add any tool you want into any tool tab. So certainly if you're working on a, a smaller monitor or a smaller laptop, then it can be useful to customize the workspace a bit so you have a bit more room going on. Okay, so what were we gonna do? Style brush, that's right. So I'm gonna grab our Brighton brush. So Dodge down here. So I just need to click it once. Soon as I start brushing on the photo, Capture One will make me a layer and we can start applying the adjustment. Now this brush is a bit on the hefty side, so let's right click and make that smaller. I want it relatively small and soft. And notice that the style brushes always have a low flow. And if you're new to using layers and local adjustments and brushes and so on, flow is a really important brush setting because what flow does is just restrict the amount of adjustment that we're brushing in per brush stroke. So whether you're using a pen or a mouse, doesn't matter, every pass of the brush or the mouse will just put a tiny bit, in this case, 4% of the adjustment on each stroke. So it means in some areas we can do a lot of brush strokes to build up a big change and a small amount of brush strokes to do uh, a smaller change. So I just wanna brighten up this area a little bit, just like so, and stop there. Now it might not look much has happened, but if we turn off our dodge layer, you can see before and after like so, and I just brighten up a bit on the top, just so they're lifting off the page a bit more. Now really, I think that's all we need to do. Do we need to do any other healing or anything like that? Actually, the only slightly annoying thing is this dot over the back here. So that's just a quick fix with the healing brush. Click on the offending uh, article and then Capture One will pick the best spot and take it away. If, if it hadn't have rather cleverly picked the same color and density to fix that, I can always pick this up and then move it somewhere else. But that worked really nicely. So to look at our before and after, let's click on our before and after tool. So again, this was pretty good out of camera, but as I said, the main distracting thing is this bright area to the right. So we can just kill that down a bit with our linear gradient, so that looks better. And then we brightened up those boys a bit in the middle, as you can see, and adding a bit more contrast with our levels tool. And overall, we added, if we go back to our radial, then you can see just a slight vignette, makes the background look a bit earthier and darker. Uh, got rid of that annoying spot. And also our little dodge in the middle just to brighten those up a little bit. So let's just pop that there for a second and you can see the difference. Okay, any questions? Let's have a look. Uh, what's the preset style for this shot? I saw um, Brian asking. There wasn't, there was no preset style. So that, that just 
how it looked out of camera because capture one is awesome so if we do a a, a new where are we new variant so that'll be a new variant with no adjustment so that's literally as it came out of camera so very nice light great colors all of that um, good color profile thanks capture one so that's just with our changes so out of camera and a few changes like so uh, I think we're good for questions. Um, okay, let's see. No, I think Diego's pretty much answered all the questions in there. You guys are happy on YouTube uh, and Facebook, so that's fantastic. Okay, so I think what we can do is move on to the next photo pretty good as well. One last little quick check. Just want to make sure I haven't missed anything popular. Okay, great. All right, let's move on. So thanks to Emily for the loan of that picture. And let's go and move on to we've done our environmental portrait. Let's pick up this landscape here, because again, pretty nice out of camera, but a few subtle edits, we can actually improve on it by a good amount as well. So this is from Eric Ronald, one of our new ambassadors. So if you haven't checked out our new ambassador lineup, please do so. Uh, you can find them on our Instagram channel. There's a web page dedicated towards them as well. Really impressive lineup of people, so do check them out. Okay, so first of all, um, we can see that it's probably not quite level. Now, this is a bit of a deceptive shot because the beach, I think, shelves quite steeply into the sea. The trees are fairly straight. Um, probably wouldn't trust the telegraph poles necessarily to be straight but it, to me it looks like it's tipping a little bit so normally to do a minute rotation adjustment i prefer to use the rotation and flip tool here so you can either drag the slider and bounce it around like so if you want to do minimal changes clicking into the value box is a good idea and then you can use your arrow keys so if you look on my keyboard here, if I just click downwards, that's giving me a point, let's move that cursor, that's giving me a 0 0.01 change, so very, very fine. If I hold the shift key down as well, just over here on the left hand side, then that will give us a point, <coughs> excuse me, that will give us a 0.1 change. So a slightly more dramatic one. So if we get the overhead camera out the view, out the way, I'll probably just spin that a little. As I said, the beach is deceptive, so it's not like we're going to make the beach like this, because I think that's probably a bit too much, but somewhere in there, because it's nice that it's sweeping in as well. So grab my crop tool. Let's cut out a bit of the sea. I don't think we need that much to have a bit more of a panoramic cut going on like so. So that's a, a nice look. It's obviously quite hazy, so we've got some choices here. Do we want to get rid of the haze? Personally, I wouldn't. Do we want to get rid of a bit of the haze? I think might be nice. If we look at the levels tool again, classic kind of histogram of when a shot could look a little bit too on the flat side. We've got very little information over here, not so much information here, big bag of midtones, uh, so it can often look a bit flat. So if we say auto, Capture One's going to set our shadow and the highlight points. Now that has improved the contrast quite dramatically. So if we go option click before and after, that's done a big job or a big way into going and taking off some of the haze and improving the contrast. But for me personally, it's probably a bit too much. So I actually like the hazy look, so I'd back that off a bit. Don't forget there's also the dehaze tool. So if you do want to really get rid of the haze, then you could also pull this across and uh, get rid of a lot more of it. But for this shot, I kind of expect it to be a bit hazy. If you look at the trees in the background, it's probably humid as hell, <laughs> really hot. So to, to get rid of that atmosphere seems a bit too much, to be honest. Okay, um, what are we gonna do next? Just lost my thought process for a second. Yeah, there we go. So on the subject of haze, I might like to add a bit of clarity in the sea, but not so much um, on the background here, because contrast wise, that's, you know, it's pretty good. But if we pull up the clarity and see what happens, 
then if I just pull that up slowly, this actually improves the C quite nicely to some extent, but I don't really want it on the background. Now what we could do is paint that in with a style brush, but if we look on our style brushes, we don't have anything specifically which adds clarity. So we're gonna do it with a layer and then later on we can actually save that as a bit of a style brush. Here's one we made earlier, which was from our earlier webinar. So what I'm gonna do is let's just um, delete that style brush. Let's get rid of that one and then we're gonna make that later on because it actually worked out really nicely for a second shot. Okay, so let's get rid of our clarity. So we've got no clarity going on. So I wanna put a bit of clarity here, but not much going on there and use that to build a style brush later as well. So if we add a new field adjustment layer, so that's making a layer over the whole shot. So if I press M on my keyboard, then you can see we've got a layer everywhere. Now I can dial in the amount of clarity that I want and I'm ignoring this bit. We're just concentrating on the C. So if I just pull this up till I roughly get the amount of clarity that I like and I can be quite strong. And depending how sharp it is, um, it's pretty sharp. Let's just add a teeny bit of structure as well. But it's too much going on in the background here that's too strong for my liking. So we're gonna call this uh, C Clarity, like so. And we're gonna right click and now clear the mask. Now that's not gonna get rid of the adjustments. That's just gonna clear out our clarity amount. Sorry, it's just gonna clear out the mask, uh, but not our clarity amount. Excuse me, I'm talking nonsense. So when I say clear mask, the mask is gone, but the clarity amount, which we dialed in, we can now use to brush back in gently where we see fit. So if I grab my brush, right click once more to look at the controls. And again, this is a good use of flow. So I don't wanna paint the whole lot in in one go because I can do a bit more up here, but probably not so much down here. So right away, if we start brushing, this will gradually add in my clarity and structure amount. So I can do a little bit there, just don't want quite so much in this corner but more up in that corner, like so. So now if we turn off C clarity, you can see before and after like so, but I've still got my nice hazy-ish background. If we press M on the keyboard, you can see what the mask looked like and notice that its opacity varies because with that flow nice and low, then it's gonna build up that mask gradually. Okay, uh, finally, we're gonna do a little bit of color grading and we'll come back later and we will create a style brush out of that when we need it. So uh, color grading wise, I'm gonna add a new field adjustment layer once more because it helps to do color grading on the layer. It gives us more flexibility, means we can use other adjustments to build a whole color look for the shot in itself. So let's call this color grade like so and go to our color balance tool. So the color balance tool, if you haven't uh, played with it, it's well worth getting to grips with it. Super simple to use. Uh, there's a whole webinar about it, which was on um, a few weeks back. So check that out if you want to really see it used in a variety of different ways. But for this shot, remember we're on our field layer here, like so, M on the keyboard. So the mask is over the whole shot. It's gonna affect everything. So let's uh, pull down. We don't have a great deal of shadows in this area, as you can see. So it's likely the shadow slider is probably not gonna do a whole bit. It does a little bit, actually. So let's put a bit of teal into those shadows. And mid-tone wise, let's warm up the mid-tones a touch as well. And also our highlights. Because I feel it's, you know, it's a warm, hazy, humid, sunny day. So let's get some general warmth in, into it as well. I might prefer this to be a little bit more uh, subdued. So on this color grading layer, let's take the saturation down a touch as well. So if we turn off color grade, you can see before and after, like so. So a bit more subtle in tones, a bit more teal in the shadows, a bit warmer, but taking some saturation down a little bit as well. So I think for me, oh, one last thing, let's grab our healing brush. So you see what's in the middle here, 
don't know what that is, but it's sort of slap bang in the middle of the photo. So it's not, not very nice to have it there, a bit distracting. So grabbing our healing brush, um, let's make it a bit smaller and let's just take out whatever that is. Capture One doesn't do a good pick, it's not bad, but because we've got those lines streaking on the beach, we can line those up so it looks better. You can use your cursor keys too. So if I just click on my cursor keys, so if we zoom in to a crazy amount, you can see those lines. So that's probably the best match I'm gonna get, I would say. And then we've also got this one over here, so let's get rid of that, whoops. Now what I did there, because this is still orange selected, if I brush again, Capture One's gonna use that as the source point. So I don't want it to do that. I want it to have a new source point, which I can also adjust as well. So let's try, that one wasn't super successful. So sometimes it's just a case of trying a few different spots, especially if it's something with those lines in the sand light. So that's better. It's much more convincing. And there we have it. I might just crop down a little bit more at the end. So turning on our before and after, that's how we came out of camera. Yes, it's hazy. Do I want to get rid of all the haze? Not really, because that takes away the atmosphere. So that's doing a bit of color grading, adding some contrast in this area, adding some clarity in the sea so it's a bit sharper and we can see the peaks and troughs and so on, but keeping the haze in the far distance because that's a lot more sympathetic to how it would actually be. Is that a whole bunch of people up there? Oh yeah, look at that. So we could have dehazed it completely, but I just don't think it works on this shot. Uh, Peter says, can we try a quick black and white conversion? Sure, let's hit black and white, see what happens. There we go, not bad. What I would probably do for this one, if I just go back to the background layer, is just add a little bit more contrast. There we go, that looks really nice actually. So thanks Peter, uh, good, good recommendation. Uh, that actually worked really nicely with this one too. What was the edit we did? Was it this one? Yeah, this one. So again, sometimes nice to have a look at black and white. Also not bad, a little bit flat. Also once more, I think I would just do a little Luma curve contrast adjustment. And the reason why I'm doing Luma is just a force of habit more than anything else because if we'd played around and tweaked these sliders and what these sliders do is just change the density based on the color range, if you then go and use an RGB curve, an RGB curve can't help but shift the colors that it can upset this as well. So I'm well used to just using a Luma curve in black and white, but that also looks pretty nice too. And so does our Indian scene as well. It's very much Indian theme this week. Okay, um, let's have a look at a couple of questions. I uh, saw so Jack said, couldn't the sky be a bit enhanced? Uh, maybe, it's not a great deal to enhance there singular tone, like if we crank up uh, the clarity fully, was that the one we just edited? Uh, let's see, adjustment layer. Or oh, was it this one? I'm losing myself now. Did I do my clarity on the wrong layer for a second? I think I did, what a nutter. I think it was still on the background, silly David. That's better. So schoolboy error there. I put my um, clarity amount on the wrong spot. Uh, could we enhance the sky? Maybe, but there's not, you know, there's not a huge amount going on really in the sky. If we go on the background and just max out the clarity, you could get a little bit more out of it. But personally, I quite like the haziness of it. But you could, you could try a little bit to get more out of it, potentially, if you uh, wanted to. Oh, it's because we did the black and white one, that's why. I wasn't going crazy. I did do my clarity on that one. That was a, a shot from earlier this morning, I think. So not going completely crazy. That's good to know. Uh, Abbott says, by rotating the man starts to lean. Yeah, so maybe I was a little bit too aggressive. So let's stick him back like that. Is that better? 
actually really like it in black and white. Are you able to display the grid whilst using the arrow key? Uh, you are not, I'm afraid. So I know that would be useful, but don't forget, you do also have guides, horizontal and vertical guides, which you can have a shortcut key here as well. So if you wanted to add some guides, you can do so. If you have your select cursor tool, then you can move these guides, guides around and pop them wherever you like. So if you want to try and line something up like telegraph pole, man, architectural feature or whatever, then use the uh, guides because then you can pop those anywhere. Uh, last question. And then we shall move on. Let's see. Uh, did, did. Tim said, did we lose the blue in the sky? Yes, but that was on purpose. So I prefer to see it a bit more muted. But of course, if you want to enhance the blue, then you can go the other way as well. Right, let's go on to the next one. So I know there's a few other questions there, but we could spend the whole session uh, answering questions. But big thanks to uh, Peter for suggesting the black and white because that looks super nice on that shot. Okay, let's go to this one because this is actually a really interesting shot because we can talk about noise reduction, which is not something we do a great deal of talking about, or at least I don't, because generally the defaults out of the box work really, really nicely. So this is shot on a GFX 50, which is a great camera, which means we can crop the bejesus out of it as well. Now I know it might be a little bit hard for you to see on the webinar transmission due to compression and all those kinds of things. So if I zoom into a ridiculous amount, then you can see that there's a little bit of noise going on in the background. Now, as the background is literally just that, a nice mottled background, we can afford to be a bit more aggressive with our noise reduction. Before we get to that, let's just crop the bejesus out of it. And this looks quite nice in square format. So with our crop tool selected, we can right click and switch to square. And as soon as I start cropping, it will snap to a square format. So let's go a little bit tighter in like so. Again, if we wanted to rotate, another method is you can just hover outside the corner of your cropped frame and then decide how you want to rotate. So we can drag left and right to do so. So let's angle it like that a little more. And now we can start to do our editing. So as I said, Looking at the background, it's a little bit noisier. Now to understand how noise reduction works in Capture One, if we look at our noise reduction tool, let's just float it out for a second, you will always see those three values, 50, 50, 50. Now we had a question on this morning's webinar like, oh, how do I set all those to zero? 50 is too much. Actually 50 is not too much. 50 is a good compromise between noise reduction, but retaining detail. So think of this as uh, a new zeros, if you like, a new zero. Now these values that you see here are also camera dependent and also ISO dependent. And as I said, they're a good compromise between getting rid of noise, but not sacrificing detail. So 50, 50, 50 is exactly that, the best compromise. Now in this case, because we've got a singular toned background, the noise is a little bit more apparent. And also because we can deal with the background separately to the flower, what I'm gonna do is just bump up uh, the noise reduction greater for the background. But we're not gonna do it on the whole shot because that's gonna add a bit more noise reduction and a bit more softening to the flower itself. So what we want to do is treat the background separately from the flower and then we can decide exactly how much additional noise reduction we can put on the background without affecting the detail from the flower. So hold that thought for the moment and let's see what we can do to select this background with the minimum of fuss whatsoever. Before we do that exposure wise, let's just give it a little bump, not too much and leave it there because I actually want the background possibly a bit darker. We could tweak the color of it and so on. So what we're gonna do is use our color editor because masking around this guy would be very time consuming and a bit annoying. But hopefully what we can do is use the advanced color editor 
to do the masking for us. So we're going to grab our color picker. I'm going to click on the background. Capture One's going to give us a suggested color range. To see what this actually is, if we click on View Selected Color Range, Capture One will turn to monochrome everything that's not part of the selection. So that's actually done a pretty good job. Now, if we zoom in to, let's just zoom in a lot so you can see what's going. Let's turn on View Selected Color Range once, once more. Now it might be a bit hard to see. Let's actually tweak the, the hue so you can see better. So if I pull the hue in this direction, that's effectively moving my picked point this way around the circle. If I move it in this direction, that's moving the pick point around that circle. But you see where the edges, we've got a little bit of bleed or it just doesn't look especially good. So you can see like so. So sometimes you can fix that by bumping up the smoothness. And what smoothness does is control the roll off into the neighboring colors. Now, as this is not really a neighboring color between the flower and the background, it doesn't really solve us this slightly crunchy edge. So what we're gonna do before we do anything else is actually turn this into a mask and then improve that mask. So once again, if we turn on view selected color range, we've got a pretty nice selection of the background and not the flower. So to turn this into a mask, what do we do? Well, there's a little known feature under here, create mask layer from selection. So essentially transform that into a layer like so. Only takes a few seconds. And now if I press M on my keyboard, you can see the mask that it's created like so with pretty much a minimum of fuss. Now to highlight the issue that we were looking at further, best way to do that is to look at the grayscale mask. So if we turn on the grayscale mask, you can see the issue that I was hinting at. If we look at the edges of the mask, they're a little bit on the you know, brutal side. It's done a massively good job. I mean, look at that. Imagine trying to mask that by hand. That would take you forever. <clears throat> but it's a little bit brutal. So how can we improve on that? So let's stay on our grayscale mask and we're gonna call this um, flower. So we know what it is. Right click and say, where are you? Refine. So in this sub menu, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do with masks. We could feather it, that might help. Uh, but refining tends to be a bit more accurate. So if we turn on a refine mask, like so, let capture one think for a second. And that's already just feathered off the edge of the mask quite nicely. If we go to zero, that's before. If we go to 300, that's gonna have a massive difference. And then you see, you know, the feelers have crept out from the edge and so on and gone all the way to the center because we had such a big radius. But I want to just improve or refine the edge to some extent without going into the middle. So let's try that like so. So now our mask isn't quite so binary. It's a bit more refined, a bit softer, and that should lend us to be able to do a better um, correction. So we've just got our background. So now once again, I can pick on my background once more and decide what I want to do. So we can pull around the hue, we can make it, you know, move the color point gradually this way around the circle, or we could go this way, which I prefer a bit. Uh, let's darken it down slightly. And, you know, if we bump up saturation, drop it down, we could really kind of pull around the colors to, to quite a big extent. So I'm gonna stick with something like that. And then we don't have that weird edge issue that we did when we were just using the color editor. Also now, because we've got our, um, sorry, I named that flower, my mistake, background. Whoa, that was terrible typing. Background number two, if you like. So that's just our background. And as I said, now that we've isolated that, we can deal with the noise reduction separately. So if we just zoom in, let's get this out the way, we can bump in some extra noise reduction on top. So I can afford to be relatively aggressive because it's not affecting the star of the show, which is the flower up here. So I can give some extra luminance noise reduction. Again, sorry if it's hard for you guys to see watching out there. 
um, but if I just click on this before and after, it just softens off that green a bit. But that's a good technique that you can use, you know, on any subject like this, if you want to treat a background and foreground separately in terms of sharpening. Also, what we do on the background layer, we're just gonna kill any sharpening because that's just gonna sharpen our noise to some extent as well. So now we've successfully got our background, how do we successfully get the flower? Well, the good news is um, you've already done the hard work. So you don't have to then go ahead and think, oh, how can I select the flower in the same way? Could I use the color editor, et cetera, et cetera. You've already got the basics of the mask, which is this, the background. So we just need to invert that. Now, fortunately, if we make a new layer and call this flower, we can right click and we can copy that mask from the background. So it would just be completely identical. And the next thing that we would wanna do, if we just turn the mask on, right click and say invert. And hey presto, we've got a perfect mask of our flower like so. So now we can deal with exactly what we want that's a bit close in terms of sharpening detail and so on so we stripped out the sharpening if you remember we added additional noise reduction into the background so now we can just focus on the edit here so what i would like to do with this uh, we could probably add in a little bit more clarity make sure our highlights don't go too crazy sorry brightness like so and then we could add in a bit of structure for the stamen, I believe, thinking back to secondary school uh, education. Um, and then we could also add some sharpening back in as well, but not too much because we don't want it to go over the top. But if we turn this layer off and back on, that's just boosted our contrast, added the sharpening, which we took out and so on and so forth. So really, all the hard work was done there by the color editor. So if we go to the initial layer, that little single click selection went on to create that background, which was easy to then sort out our noise reduction or increase our noise reduction. And just by having that mask meant it was easy to copy it and invert it to do this. And the crucial step of course here was if we turn on our grayscale mask, so there's a little bug, which means it doesn't activate properly sometimes. There we go. And the crucial step here was to do that refined step so it just wasn't quite so angry at the edges, if you like. Now, you, there's nothing to stop you uh, refining again if you need to do more. We could even you know, feather the mask to some extent if we wanted to soften that off. So you can just build up those different layer adjustments uh, should you need to, but I don't think it's necessary in this case. Of course, this was helped by having a background that was vastly different from the foreground or at least different enough to do a very quick, easy separation. But it's a good technique which you can use pretty much on uh, any genre as well. Okay, let's have a look in the Q&A tab. Um, Martin says, David, is there a reason you don't use auto mask? I do use it sometimes, but to be honest, in this particular case, uh, auto mask would have taken me much, much longer. So it probably would have worked fine just around this edge. But then if we wanted to include this stem, you've got to, you know, brush your way down the stem and so on. Whereas the color editor was just a one click solution, really. So it's by far the, the easiest way to do it, I would say. Uh, let's see, good question from Alan. Can you explain the difference between clarity and structure? So clarity is a mid-tone contrast adjustment. Now it's probably harder to see on this shot. So let's go back to an unedited version of this. If we were to heap in tons of contrast, what happens? Very quickly, we can see that the shadows get too dark. The highlights are a bit too bright. This isn't particularly nice to, to look at. We're losing detail here. So aggressive contrast doesn't look good. Even though in Capture One you can push this quite hard, you still have to watch what you're doing. So clarity, aggressive clarity, look, even at 100 points, that'd be too much for me, but we can still be fairly aggressive with it. 
The difference with Clarity is that it's doing a contrast adjustment, but it's avoiding the shadow areas. So that's why we don't get this phenomenon of shadows blocking up and looking nasty. Structure is almost doing the same thing, but it's at pixel level. So the net result of that is an increase in detail. So if we go to Indian Beach, let's see if we zoom in on this dude and we uh, bump up some structure. Let's go to the background. Let's do it aggressively. So you see all the edge definition suddenly becomes stronger. So you have to use it with a bit of care, but with a good sharp photo, it can really improve uh, on the edge definition. If the photo is soft or not in focus or has lots of noise, structure won't magically make that happen. So it, with structure, you need to have, if you like, a good start point for it to be effective. Uh, let's see. Um, can I make black and white work on a layer? That was Richard, no, sorry, not Richard's question, Michael's question. You can't make the black and white tool work on a layer. It doesn't, unfortunately. So if you wanted to do black and white in some areas, if I did a new field adjustment layer and then took saturation down to zero, then we could also have a black and white. And if I took my erase brush, uh, and let's just make that a bit harder, and then I erased bits in my mask, then you could have a mix of black and white and color, if you like. So that's the way to do it, just by using the saturation slider, like so. So it is possible, but it's just a bit of a workaround. How are we doing for time? Enough time for the last one, that's good. I'm just gonna double check um, questions. Alexander says, can I export the grayscale mask to Photoshop? No, you can't, unfortunately, which um, might be quite useful, but it's uh, not possible, I'm afraid. And I think we're pretty good. Gary says, using the color editor, can you match colors in two different um, pictures exactly? You can't, what you can try is the normalize tool so if we, where are you, normalize tool? Normalize down here. So what you can do in the normalize tool is, um, this is probably gonna fail badly as we don't have a good example. But if I grab um, the normalize and say, okay, we want this color. So that records this color. I've picked this color here and I've got the RGB values. Then if I was to go to a different shot, let's go to this one and then say, make this color match. So click here. What Capture One would do was adjust uh, exposure and white balance to bring those tones equal. So now at this point, wherever I clicked, the RGB values would match, but it's done using white balance or exposure. So it doesn't work as well for massive changes, but it can be useful for, you know, aligning a series of pictures if you like. But the color editor, you could eyeball it, but you can't do it mathematically, if you like. All right, last picture, which is a tricky one. I've struggled with this shot, but that doesn't mean I should negate it. Let's just do a new variant. Oh, that one doesn't have any editing, I think. Yeah, this is how it is, out of camera. Also from Ambassador Brian Minear. So Brian did a way better job of editing this me, the, <laughs> editing this compared to me. The reason why I chose uh, this photo was that it was a good use of the Keystone tool. And also it's a good use of our Clarity brush, which we can remake from our earlier shot. Um, and it's also a good lesson in trying to be sympathetic to the lighting conditions at the time. So this was shot at sunset, I believe. So in the evening, seven o'clock. So we've got a couple of choices to make in how this picture should look. Do we want to make it look like daylight? No, I don't think so. Uh, do we want to try and be sympathetic to the fact that it was sunset? Yes. Before we get to that, I thought this was quite a nice use of the keystone tool. So generally the keystone tool is used, you know, for architecture and interiors. 
but it also can be nice if you just want to change the lie of the land a bit. So I felt that just those rocks in the background, I wanted a bit more prominence to them. So just with a few points of the keystone tool, then we can just raise up the back of those cliffs a bit. It's not by, mu not by much, but when we look at the crop tool, we can see what it's done. It's just pushed the edges out like so. So I'm gonna change the crop a bit. Oh, we've got our square crop up. So let's go to unconstrained. Pull this a bit further out and then decide, do we want more foreground or do we want more sky? I'm gonna go for something like that, I would say. Okay, so we've got our composition in. Change the keystone a bit. So now we need to decide on what we're gonna do for exposure, white balance, all those kinds of things. Should we brighten it up to this extent? No, because now it's kindly lost all the life and the atmosphere in it. So we've got to be really careful. And I think it's fine to keep it a bit moodier and darker. And also by warming it up a bit, now the atmosphere is back. Because at the default white balance, the camera, if we just go back to how it was shot, had overcompensated for the warmth that bit too much. It's very cool everywhere particularly down in the front here, which is probably just fallen into shadow. So let's just warm it up a touch like so. So I'm looking to get the warmth about right in the mid, mid ground, but it's still a little bit on the cool side here. The good news is we have a style brush for that. So we've got balance cool, balance warm. So I just want to warm up down here a bit more. So if I grab the balance warm, make this brush significantly bigger and it's not going to need much but just a few brushes along here a bit more on this side just to equal that out to some extent so now if we turn off balance warm slightly cool a little bit more in tune with everything else so i feel that's better so that's a positive benefit for us just looking at the levels again is this a good case for auto levels let's see what happens whoops close sorry uh, is it a good case for auto levels I don't think so really not quite that's a bit too much I think you would agree I mean if we'd shot this at three o'clock in the afternoon maybe that's a good result but it's just a little bit too much so just pulling the highlights back suddenly makes it look a little bit more interesting thirdly if we look at the shadows, they're just getting a bit too deep up in here. Great detail in everything. So once again, this would be a good reason to have a bit of structure because that would just highlight all these uh, rock formations that little bit better. Again, be subtle with it. Don't push it too much. I wouldn't mind opening up the shadows just along here slightly. If I do that with the shadow slider, it's opening up the foreground a bit too much. Once again, there's a style brush for that. So if we grab shadows recover, make this a little bit smaller. By the way, if you want the speedy way to make your brush settings change, right click brings up the panel. If you want the speedy version, if you're on a Mac, control and option together. And when I drag left and right, you see we have that little heads up display up and down. So up and down with the mouse like so, then it changes the hardness. If you're on a PC, same, but you would right click to drag, okay? If we do shift control option, spider hands, then that will change your flow and opacity parameters. Once again on a PC, right click, drag, and that will change it. Uh, all right, so we had our, uh, do we have it picked? Shadows recover softer and a bit bigger. I'm not worried about it spilling over onto the sky because the sky isn't really a shadow. So the brush isn't gonna have a huge amount of change to that. And then just a quick wipe like so. Now that's relatively dramatic. Good news is we've got an opacity slider. So that's with no adjustments. I just want a little bit like so. Now overall, if we add a bit of clarity, bit too much because this I feel this gets too bright nice to add a little bit of clarity 
kind of where we feel it's best, just a small amount. Now, the good news is if we take ourselves back to India, let's just delete that adjustment layer. We had our C clarity layer, which added quite a bunch of clarity and I don't think it did anything else. So how do we convert that to a... So if we go to our style brush tool, right click and say save style brushes. Oops, David, remove keyboard from the screen, sorry. Thank you, Peter. Um, if we come up and say save style brush in the style brush tool, then we get this dialog which asks us what adjustments do you want to save in this style brush? So I want clarity. Which brush settings do we want to save in the style brush? Well, currently, how big's my brush? That's probably pretty good. Now, brush size is based on camera resolution. So if this was a 24 megapixel shot and then I use this style brush on a 100 megapixel shot, comparatively, my brush would be much smaller. So just consider that if you are saving the size of the style brush in your style brushes, that was a lot of style brushes. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with roughly this size. We've got a nice low flow set. Opacity is max as well, so that's all good. So I'm gonna say save style brush. We want clarity is good. And then I want to save all my brush settings. Don't really need those, like so. So now my brush and eraser are gonna be set to that size and say save. Need to give it a name, so we call this add clarity. Clarity, and say save. And now under my custom style brushes, we have add clarity, clarity. So let's take away, let's go back to the USA, click on my add clarity brush. I'm gonna make it a bit smaller because I've got a feeling this is a 100 megapixel camera. Let's see, GFX 100S, it is. So you see how much smaller that style brush looked. So that's why the built-in style brushes don't have a default size set uh, because we don't know what megapixel camera you're using, if you like. So add clarity. So I'm gonna add a little bit of clarity over here. We can add some down at the rocks in front. We can add a little bit just up on the background like so. And I think that would be enough. So if we turn off add clarity, it's very subtle before and after like so. Just a bit of extra contrast down here. That's kind of where our eye is going as well. So we can be nice and subtle with it. Now with the blue sky, this is where I didn't quite know what the best result was. So if we go to our color editor and pick the blue sky, we've got some choices. We could go in that direction, which lessens it a little bit, which I actually like. Didn't seem that the majority liked what I did with the India sky, but there we go. Or we could go in this direction and make it bluer. So your choice. We could also make it more saturated. We could also darken it to make it more dramatic. I'm not a big fan of crazy big skies, so my personal choice would probably be something more like that. Because it's a sunset, I feel this is an dominating the sky too much. So I would personally do that, but we could imagine, argue about that for a long time about how it should look the best. But that's what I personally would do. But with the color editor, the good news is you could go in any direction that you like. You could also save that as a layer if you wanted to do other things to the sky as well, but that would be my choice. So out of all the million times I've edited this shot, this is actually the one I like the most. I think the only thing I might do is just crop off. That bit of snow at the front was a bit annoying, I think. So let's go full screen for a second. Now if we do before and after, that's how we came out of camera. Before and after doesn't show compositional changes or the Keystone tool because it would be very hard to compare. And then that's after a few of our changes like so, which had a good, use of the various different style brushes. So balancing up the front a bit, just match that in really nicely, recovering some shadows in the rocks in the background, adding a little bit of clarity kind of in this ridge that's going here. And that was it. And a few of our edits on the background, of course, namely with the blue sky and some of the default things. How's that for timing? Not bad, before you go, I'm gonna launch a poll 
which I can't necessarily control uh, when it pops up on screen. So if it comes up a bit too soon or uh, not soon enough, then I apologize. So you might see your screen get interrupted with that in a second. Um, for those of you on YouTube and Facebook, you're not gonna see a poll, but don't worry. It's just me asking everybody what version of Capture One you're using. So feel free to put in the comments on Facebook and YouTube, whether you're on 21, 20, an older version, it's just good for me to know uh, for the future as well. So I'm gonna kick that poll off there as well. While that poll is running on the webinar, uh, I'm gonna look at the last few questions on YouTube and Facebook and then let you get on with your Thursdays. So let's have a look at the last couple of questions. Let's see, color editor is a win, Terry says. Glad uh, to hear it. Um, when two people are editing the same images, is there a quick way for the edited changes to be displayed in the tools so we can see what each other has done? Well, you're always going to see the edits, Brian, in the tools. So whenever um, anyone is looking at a shot, they're always going to see the slider slider values. But there isn't a summary, if you like, of, of uh, total changes. But that maybe could be something nice uh, for the future as well. Um, looking over on YouTube, lots of 21 users. Thank you very much. Um, mm -mm -mm. Thomas, you were asking about printing. There is actually a tutorial. Uh, don't forget to tell us new users how to calculate dimensions to print at a photo. The good news is Capture One does it for you. If you look on our Learning Hub or YouTube channel on export, or process recipes, there's actually a section on how to do that. But if you wanna calculate it perfectly, if you look in uh, process recipes, here's a good example, TIFF A3 print. Let's change this to dimensions. Let's say you needed to do a print that was, well, let's not ruin this recipe, let's do a new one. Let's say you wanna do an A4 print. Uh, the scale, we would say dimensions, um, a4 is roughly 21 by 29.7. Don't shoot me if I'm incorrect. And the trick is, Thomas, in the crop tool, change this to output. And then now, however I move the crop tool, it's scaled exactly to A4. Even I can squish it, and then we can make a, a, a A4 portrait. Or if I squish, the force the crop down, we can make a A4 landscape and Capture One is calculating exactly what the pixel dimensions need to be. The super cool thing is, is that if we come out of the crop tool for a second, is that also in the process recipe, you can dial in some sharpening for print as well. And that would be based on um, the viewing distance, uh, or it can be based on yeah, sorry, the distance as a percentage of the diagonal or the physical viewing distance that you're holding the print up. But it's all there, all there in the tutorial, Thomas. So look, look for the tutorial on process recipes and we walk you through that. Um, that's a good question. Could we have a process recipe that compensates for a specific output like a printer? A curve would be nice. What I would do with that, um, Helder, sorry, I pressed on the wrong question. What I would do with that is, of course, you could do that as like a helper layer, if you like. So a helper layer like printer curve or whatever, that, that kind of thing. So you could do it also as, if you did it as a style brush, you could then, that would be nice. So let's say this was a helper printer layer and then by default we could have a really big brush and it could have max flow and max hardness and then you could just brush over the whole shot and then that would be called my Epsom P80 and then you could turn that on and off like so. Again, this shot also looks nice in black and white. Should have done everything in black and white today. <laughs> um, all right, let's pick two more questions and then we can go. Um, Archie, I have a micro four thirds camera. Can, can you give me tips on handling noise? Um, I have a micro four thirds camera as well, quite an old one now, and it is a bit noisy. So really your best 
bet is try and shoot at low ISO if you can. Don't turn off the noise reduction. Remember, this is a good default. Don't be afraid to bump up the luminance if you need to. That's really your best bet. And make sure um, also that if you're on Capture 121, make sure you're not using an old process engine as well if you're working on older pictures because the process engine on version 12, as an example, does not have as good as noise reduction as 20 and 21. So that's also something to keep an eye on. But the luminance slider is your friend when it comes to um, noise reduction. Okay, last question. And I think uh, we're good to go. Andrea says, what's the best way to apply changes only on shadows without creating strange artifacts? Well, like a lot of photo editing, it's don't go too far. I mean, the sliders here, so for shadows, whites and blacks and so on, have a pretty broad range, but doesn't mean that you need to use them. So if we look at this shot on our background layer, if we open up the shadows and pull the highlights down, yes, we've recovered a lot of detail. Does it look pleasant? Not really. So to be honest with these sliders, you shouldn't really be getting any artifacts if you're using them with finesse, if you like. But if you do ever have any strange artifacts, there's a couple of things you can do. You can join our our group on Facebook, Capture One Creative Lab and, Lab, and ask the community there. You can make a support case and ask us. Uh, there's plenty of other Capture One forums as well. A lot of the th these things, it's very hard to judge without actually seeing the picture, and then we can definitely give you much better advice as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and say goodbye to everybody so thanks for uh, joining us today uh, sorry we can't answer all your questions there was rather a lot of you if you are watching on YouTube don't forget to hit the subscribe button please uh, there's a good benefit to that if you hit the little bell as well it means whenever we go live on YouTube which we do quite a few times a month then you'll get a notification half an hour before and also when we go live as well so do do that if you are on YouTube it's great to have your subscriptions thanks again every thanks again everyone for joining us today I hope you found that useful and hope to see you again in the future have a good evening everyone and take care bye now